My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Of all the images of Christmas, the nativity scene is most iconic. A young couple crouched over in a humble manger, surrounded by animals, cradle a newborn child. In the distance, angelic choirs sing God's praise to shepherds watching their flocks by night. The story, most familiar and dear to the hearts of many, leaves us with the impression that all was well that holy night. Even our carols sweetly sing of that night when love came down. We're told all was calm and all was bright. And the stars in the bright sky looked down upon the baby Jesus asleep in the hay. The words warm our weary hearts and soothe our frenzied spirits as we race to prepare our Christmas feast. Yet, was everything so calm and idyllic that first Christmas night when Christ was born in Bethlehem? Despite our picturesque paintings in the nativity and our ever hopeful hymns, the birth of Jesus was anything but serene. Whether Luke's account of Jesus' birth is historically accurate or not, we know that Jesus was born in troubled times. Israel was occupied by Roman forces. Most of its citizens lived in impoverished conditions. Some estimate that 80% of the people lived in poverty. And his parents, well, if Matthew's account is accurate, were likely in a difficult situation given Jesus' conception before their marriage was finalized. The young couple clearly had nowhere to go and instead found themselves searching for some place of comfort and peace. It was a rather unlikely situation in which anyone would suspect for God to make an appearance. Yet God does. God enters into our human experience and into the place where nobody suspects. Although I love and cherish the stories of Jesus' birth, I worry that we sentiment, sentimentalize the story so much that it becomes unreal for us. Rather than find God close to us, God remains ever hidden behind a cloud of mystery, only to be found with the most pure and perfect of persons. Yet nothing could be farther from the truth. Nor is that the point of Luke's account of the birth of Jesus. Rather, God is to be found in the least likely of places, among those whom the world rejects and ignores. Few people have appreciated this more than Dietrich Bonhoeffer. For those of you unfamiliar with the man, Bonhoeffer was a German Lutheran pastor who lived during the tumultuous years of the Nazi regime. An outspoken critic of Hitler and his fascist program, Bonhoeffer called German Christians to remain faithful to the gospel at a time when most people surrendered to Hitler's rule and adopted the Christian faith in alignment to the Nazi agenda. Although Bonhoeffer had many opportunities to leave Germany and remain safe in the care of the English or the Americans, Bonhoeffer could not leave 
his beloved congregation in Germany. Instead, he returned to Germany to live and serve among the people at a time when a faithful Christian could easily be led to persecution or even death. After years of suffering constant threats and attacks from the Nazis, Bonhoeffer was eventually condemned to prison, falsely accused for collaborating with the conspirators who tried to assassinate Adolf Hitler. There, in the depths of prison, Bonhoeffer found God. In the weeks leading up to the Christmas of 1943, Bonhoeffer wrote a series of letters to his friends and family outside of the prison walls. Among those letters, one stands out in particular. Writing to his mother and father, Bonhoeffer acknowledges his family's sadness at his imprisonment during the Christmas season. Despite their fears and anxieties, Bonhoeffer makes a bold claim that he and his fellow prisoners are likely closer to God and the Christmas story than anyone else. And he writes, From the Christian point of view, there is no special problem about Christmas in a prison cell. For many people in this building, it will probably be a more sincere and genuine occasion than in places where nothing but the name is kept. That misery, suffering, poverty, loneliness, helplessness, and guilt mean something quite different in the eyes of God from what they mean in the judgment of man. That God would approach where others turn away. That Christ was born in a stable because there was no room for him in an inn. These are the things that a prisoner can understand better than other people. For to him, they really are glad tidings. Bonhoeffer's note that God will approach where others turn away speaks more to the heart of Christmas than anything else. While we flee from the pain and suffering of this world and look for God in the starry skies, God comes to us in the places that we least suspect. God enters into our human experience fully and completely without regard to how perfect or good we may be. Whereas we distinguish between the godly and the godless, the good and the evil, the noble and the common, Bonhoeffer writes, God loves real human beings without distinction. From the depths of prison, out of the pain of isolation from his fiance, parents, and friends, Bonhoeffer leads us to the core message of Luke's story of the Nativity. Whereas we've come to see the story of Jesus' birth as a romantic tale, it is the story of God going where no one else would go. God goes to the shepherds, the men most despised by society for their dirtiness and their inability to follow the religious laws and the customs of their day. They are the first ones to whom God shows himself, and they are the first evangelists, the first ones who go running out into the street proclaiming that Jesus Christ is born in Bethlehem, that God lives with us. Luke's story is fantastic. No one would have imagined in his day that God would come among us in the lowliness of a manger. Nor would anyone in the ancient days think of God being found first among outcasts and exiles. But Luke does. Luke sees Jesus first among the poor and the humble 
not the mighty and the proud. And so we shall find Jesus today. We will find him living among the poor, the hungry, the brokenhearted, the sick and suffering, the lonely and the afraid. We shall find Christ in the person who shows mercy and forgiveness to those who have done wrong. And we will find Christ in the physician, nurse, and caregiver who shows kindness and compassion to the sick and dying. And dare I say, we will not find God in the high palaces of the rich and powerful, the mighty rulers of our day. For Christ comes among us today, as he did so long ago, not in the temple or the palaces of Jerusalem, but in the least expected of all places, the dwelling place of the humble and meek, the exiled and the marginalized. God will be found first among those whom the world rejects and despises. That is the miracle of Christmas. This is the good news of the feast. God loves real people, real women and men who struggle day by day. God does not seek the perfect person. Rather, God assumes the fullness of our humanity with all its joys and sorrows. God makes no distinction. Nobody, as St. Leo the Great once said centuries ago, is an outsider to this happiness. So, my friends, come to this feast as you are. Let God enter into your lives, into your pain and your suffering, as well as your joy and exaltation. God loves you every bit. Let that sink in. God loves you every bit. Every bit of your being and of your person. God loves you. And God makes no distinction among us. All are loved in the kingdom of God. Let God take up your humanity and transform it with his divinity. For Jesus Christ has come among us so that we might become like him, glorious and radiant in the heavenly kingdom. Amen.